but I can't, so I'm just going to say thank you very much indeed for hosting me, to SIPS for hosting me, for the Visitor Research Programme here, for inviting me over. It's fantastic um, to be in Ottawa. Um, thank you to Philippe especially for organising it all and for the Security Studies Network for sponsoring this event. So as Philippe said, I come from the University of York um, and uh, the talk I'm going to give today is uh, based on some research, some qualitative research that I've been doing on uh, what we might call the interface between machine and human interactions as they relate to border security. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the problem or the issue of insight as it relates to border security and a little bit about what I'm going to argue is a division of labour between humans and machines um, at the border um, and how this contributes to risk profiling and governing through risk. So this is a picture of the now famous Macy conferences um, that happened in post-war United States. Um, and in these kind of famous conferences, the Macy conferences, scientists and social scientists gathered together to discuss pressing issues of the day. Now among the participants were key figures in the growing cybernetic uh, tradition or school of thought. Um, so people like Warren McCulloch, Walter Pitts, John von Neumann, uh, Norbert Weiner, and indeed the Macy conferences have in many ways become synonymous with uh, the, the crystallisation of a research agenda in computing and cybernetics that was to lay the ground for what we now understand to be artificial intelligence. So the Macy conferences were kind of a pivotal time for the, for the birth of machine learning, computing and artificial intelligence. And the discussions of McCulloch um, and his colleagues at these conferences were to have a really lasting impact into the direction that computing, machine learning and algorithms would take. Now at the heart of the cybernetics movement was a belief that the human brain could be studied in the same way that a computer could, that there was an analogy to be drawn between the human mind firing synapses and computers and electronic circuitry. So put simply, the cybernetics movement proposed that human psychology could be explained by looking at how individual neurons fired, and that if we could understand the way that information was processed in humans, we might be able to replicate um, intelligent thought within machines, and that modelling machine thought could help us understand problems of human cognition and psychology. So humans and machines and the processing of information went together, and this was, this was the cybernetics uh, kind of research field. Now there's a long history being written about cybernetics, and my paper doesn't touch on this. Um, lots of kind of very detailed uh, kind of histories have been written about the kind of key figures and interchanges between them. But for the purposes of my paper today, what I want to draw attention to um, is uh, a kind of a series of conversations that happen between the cybernetic theorists laying the groundwork for artificial intelligence and a group of psychologists from the so-called Gestalt School of Psychology. They were mainly German and had arrived in post-war United States um, fleeing kind of, uh, kind of Nazi Germany and they set up um, a so-called Gestalt School of Psychology. And they had a very interesting set of exchanges at the Macy conferences and elsewhere. Specifically, in 1951, the preeminent Gestalt psychologist Wolf van Kohler reviewed Norbert Weiner's seminal book, Cybernetics. And Kohler criticised the premise that electronic calculators and other kinds of machines could in any way serve as a model for human cognition. So he was tapping the very heart of, kind of the cybernetic um, kind of tradition. And he argued that the information processing carried out by new computing machines was what he called functionally and generically different from the way that human cognition worked. Machines, he argued, could never really know anything because among their functions there is none that can be compared with insight into the meaning of a problem. So insight then, for Kohler and for his other Gestalt theorists, was crucial to the difference between machines and computers and you couldn't draw an analogy between the two. Now, just as an aside, the Gestalt theorists kind of built an entire research agenda around the idea of insight. This is a little bit of an aside. So you know, these, these are kind of common uh, visual images associated with Gestalt um, psychology. And the Gestalt psychologists um, drew a series, uh, designed a series of, of um, experiments to show that human cognition perceived holes in the, in the environment around them. And that just, in, just as visually, 
human kind of visual capacity grasped a whole, quite apart from the elements that make it up. So it was the same for kind of cognitive higher order cognition and capacities. So they understood the, the, the matter of insight, which is my problem today, as both a matter of visual perception and also cognition. And it was insight was um, kind of uh, central to the way that humans could uh, uh, um, kind of problem solve and were ingenious and inventive in their thinking. So through a series of experiments, they showed that the human mind and also animal minds organizes relations and perspectives in a way that transcend individual kind of stimuli. And that is Gestalt theory argued that human thought had a fundamental organization that went beyond individual experiences. You were able to transpose patterns from past experience. You could grasp the whole um, with kind of bits were missing. We, we perceive holes rather than individual stimuli. And this needn't detain us more than, again, a huge history being written of Gestalt psychology. But for the purposes of the presentation today, um, I want to make the point that the Gestalt thinkers had a particular set of ideas about what insight was that was to have a really lasting impact on the way that artificial intelligence was to develop too. Because if insight was at the heart of a human problem solving and ingenuity, then actually um, it enabled them to make a kind of a serious critique of the, of the um, assumptions of the cybernetics. And in fact, the interchange between Kohler and McCulloch on this particular kind of occasion had a lasting impact because six, about 10 years after the Macy Conference in 1960, leading cyberneticist Walter McCulloch ultimately agreed with Kohler's um, insight. He said, the problem of insight or intuition or invention, call it what you will, we still do not understand. And in many ways, the whole history of computing and machine intelligence and artificial intelligence has been around this idea of how to replicate creative, insightful, ingenious thought in machines, just as the Gestalt theory is always to be a human capacity. Now, we might fast forward 80 years then, we're a long way, in fact, from the kinds of artificial intelligence that perhaps Walter McCulloch and his colleagues imagined would be now amongst us. But nevertheless, despite, you know, the kind of dreams of artificial intelligence not working out perhaps the way that they might have predicted, we do live in an age where decisions about many important aspects of our lives, our ability to cross borders, our encounters with criminal justice systems, our medical treatments, our ability to get a mortgage, a financial loan, lots of aspects of our lives are increasingly influenced or even governed by algorithmic processes. So the kinds of research that started off in post-war United States as cyberneticists have kind of you know, emerged into a series of, 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 kind of, of, of powerful influence of algorithms in our lives. So the rise of big data, of powerful computing, of machine learning, they're all altering today the ways that wars are fought, populations are policed, democracy functions, the way that commerce works, and security is produced. And at the heart of the rise of algorithms is the idea that algorithms enable computers and machines to do something that humans alone could not do. So this is about amplifying human ingenuity, amplifying human capacities. So we see this idea through various kind of explanations of practitioners and kind of software developers in the field. Um, for instance, you know, the Royal Academy of Engineering in a recent review of algorithms in public life in the UK said that algorithms give us an opportunity for better decision making by combining machine and human intelligence in a smart way. Microsoft has gone on record to say that machine learning algorithms are driven by focus to amplify ingenuity. We see in examples from facial recognition algorithms that, you know, that uh, kind of machines are speeding up processes of identification for the police. We have predictive police tools, kind of targeting police resources ahead of time and so forth. Whether it's investigating financial fraud, whether it's risk scoring for credit loans, making decisions about parole or medical treatments, algorithms really appear to be drawing the line between human-machine relations. And what I want to draw attention to throughout these kinds of explanations is that the big promise of algorithms, the one that appears again and again in explanations of why they're important and useful to us, is that insight. So algorithms applied to big data offer insight 
in a way that um, exceeds human capacity to grasp the data that's available. So software developers like IBM, for instance, make a lot of the insights that their analytical products can offer. And their solutions, for instance, promise to transform overwhelming and disparate data kind of from internal databases but kind of open source data as well. They aim to transform this data into actionable insight and intelligence to help find hidden connections and critical patterns buried within the data. And to reiterate, these insights generated by algorithms working on available data are increasingly important for us as citizens and consumers, travelers, whatever. The data right insights are behind the consumer choices that were offered on our Amazon pages. They're behind the decisions that are made about our likelihood for kind of, you know, for, for recidivism. They're behind the medicines we're prescribed. In the current context, insight then has taken on a particular meaning as it relates to data. And insight here is very different from the kind of insight that was imagined by the Gestalt psychologists in the kind of early debates. Insight's about gathering masses amounts of information for what uh, kind of SAS analytics is called a single view of all available information. So big data via algorithms offers a kind of a view of everything makes uh, information graspable in a way that's beyond human cognition, beyond human capacities. As Louisa Moore and uh, Volia Piatuk have answered, have, have argued rather, revealing hidden patterns is all about making things visible that would otherwise be invisible, to perceive the imperceptible. And that's what I think is at work in some of the border security solutions that we see being rolled out at borders increasingly. So how does data, oh, we can't really see the end of that, sorry, it's got these widescreen, mm. can you read it maybe? Never mind, I think you can come mm. later, just listen to the end of it, never mind. So how does data, how do data and algorithms work in the context of border security? And this is the, the kind of the focus that my research has taken. The first thing to note is that data analysis appears to solve a really key problem of contemporary border, which is that how can we best target risk while at the same time speeding up desirable and licit flows of people and of goods. So the dream of border security is targeting in a smart and precise way, while at the same time speeding along kind of global flows on which kind of commerce and trade and so forth you know, really rely. And we can mention lots of border screening programs that use data, you know, long-standing, especially you know, in the wake of 9-11, the war on terror, this stuff has become standard. So there's passenger name record systems in Europe, for instance. Um, we have the, what's, you know, the, kind of the Canadian, what's called scenario-based targeting. We have the US automated targeting system. So in lots of, kind of countries in the West, the turn to data involves both a speeding up and a precision targeting via passenger data. So as I said at the beginning, this paper that I'm kind of, um, kind of relating to now um, comes from a research that I did in a European Border Targeting Centre. Um, and so I spent some time talking with people who worked at this centre. Um, the centre is an open plan office. It looks a little bit like a call centre. Um, and it works 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So I was able to kind of access this centre to talk to people who are employed to, um, to check the matches that the automated targeting system has generated. Okay, so I'm talking to people who are on the interface of data targeting and kind of screening matches. So the people that I did field work with then work in a, a targeting centre, a, a European targeting centre, and they work with automated systems and a series of databases that contain immigration, police and customs information. And so these automated systems with which they work use algorithms to match travellers, incoming travellers, air travellers, to immigration, terror and criminal watch lists. And they also use, per, um, and this kind of watch list targeting or watch list matching proceeds on a kind of data called API. So API data is basically the information that's encoded in your passport, nationality, name, kind of age, you know, kind of basic um, information. And what happened was, and this is how the, the work was described to me, the data analysts uh, kind of sit in front of a screen 
and they access a list of potential hits that have been generated by the automated system. And the processor, the data analyst, must go through the list and they must refer to other databases to further information to ascertain whether the automated hit is indeed a match. You know, whether the match hit is the is this the person that's on the watch list? And then if, if they've worked out that yes it is, they can kind of confirm it, it gets passed up to a higher level, and then and, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the hit is confirmed, an alert is then sent out to kind of to, to intercept the target at a port of entry in airport. So for API data, the data encoded on the passport, basically, um, the algorithms kind of, kind of work by matching individual digits of names and dates of birth with entries on watch lists, police watch lists, customs watch lists, and so forth. Um, and what happens is that the, the analysts receive a, a potential hit with a numerical strength score, 90, 80, 100, 2. 2s don't come through, you know, it has to be beyond a threshold. And then they're in charge of kind of, you know, working out whether in, indeed it's, it's, it's the same person. So this watch list matching was compared by the people that I spoke to to what processes refer to as rules-based targeting. And this rules-based targeting will be largely is applied to PNR data, passenger name record data. So PNR data is a data set that's been gathered by the airline industry for decades. And in a post-9-11 context, it was realized that it was extremely useful for security targeting because it gives a much fuller picture of, of, of the passenger. It can include things like uh, kind of ticketing purchases, travel agents, credit card details, you know, telephone numbers, whether you've chosen a certain seat, who you're traveling with, frequent flyer information, etc., etc. So it's a commercial data set that's become extremely relevant for security purposes. So whereas the API data is about effectively matching incoming passengers with people that you know about, is this person on the watch list, has this person got a criminal record, have they previously applied for asylum, the PNR data is about targeting unknowns, people that you don't yet know about. And people are kind of uh, um, highlighted as being of interest by the fact that their new data is run against risk criteria or risk profiles. Um, so somebody might be flagged up not because they are known to the authorities, but because their <coughs> behaviour, their travel behaviour, matches a set of risk criteria. A late ticket booking, travelling on your own one way with no luggage, a certain kind of flight route and so forth. There's two kinds of targeting that, that's going on. And similarly, the data analysts with whom I worked were in charge of checking whether the automated kind of uh, uh, risk flags generated by, by analysis on PNR data were in fact the, you know, worthy of interest by digging around a bit and they, they, then they would send an alert or not. interesting about the way the data analysts spoke about their work is that you know, there's a, there's a, there was a strong uh, kind of sense that, that the data enabled a more objective, um, kind of truthful view. And of course, this is the, the, the view that we're often spoken, the authorities often, you know, kind of um, reassure us about. This is not targeting on kind of race or appearance or religion or kind of you know, background. This is targeting on, on kind of indisputable behavioural aspects. You know, if you book a ticket late and pay by cash, the argument goes, then you know we, we are with you know we, we should be having a look at you because this fits the profile. If you travel, you know, kind of from Barcelona to the UK from in the Caribbean, we want to have a look at you because that's a that's a, a kind of common smuggling route and, and so forth. So the data analyst that I spoke to kind of really confirmed this view that the data offered a more objective, truthful way of targeting risk and danger and threat. And that it was a way of kind of, um, of, of doing away with subjective, fallible judgments made by kind of human beings at borders, and this was a kind of a good thing. They also spoke a lot about uh, kind of the visual elements of being able to see um, the, the visual aspects of being able to kind of see risk. And so there's a lot of talk about the way in which data kind of can, can appear all together on a screen. Um, this uh, analyst here looks at the way in which it's very, it, it's easy with the insights that data offer to be able to get a good look at somebody. 
you know, so this person said, you know, you'd never be able to kind of to, 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 you know, to access a kind of a, a detailed travel history that might give a picture of risk normally by kind of flicking through pages of passports. But when you see somebody in a complete view on the computer screen, it's easier to, 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 to see everything all together, to get a surveillance overview. But the argument I want to make here, actually, the broader argument, is that the data analysis that we see in border security co um, context is, is profoundly visual. There's a kind of a visual, a visual regime at work. And here I can build on a kind of a growing attention within IR literature about a co-constituting relationship between visuality and politics. So you know, the visual turn in IR has been all about taking insights from feminist literature and also from post-colonial theory to look at the way in which the modern international, as we understand it, politics, international politics, as we understand it, has, has, has grown at the same time as vision has grown, as being you know, the, the, the most powerful sense of, of modernity. So the ocular essentialism of modernity is related to the growth of the international. Visuality and politics are completely intertwined, and it's impossible to separate, you know, to separate those two things out. So in the West, at least, and I'm, this is a Western history of vision, in the West, at least, the visual you know, is undoubtedly the site of truth and knowledge and power. And if we take that idea that the visual is completely implicated in politics and power, then we can see it's really related to lots of the West's governing projects from imperialism, capitalism, racism, all the way through to mechanized war. Visuality and politics are intertwined. And so analyzing the politics of the visual requires an engagement with the way that visual practices and visual discourses name and isolate and target specific subjects for governmental interventions. And we should really pay attention not just to the, the overt business of representation in media and so forth, but the way in which visual registers in all sorts of places, including for the targeting scenarios, um, make some people appear and disappear, make some people recognisable, legitimate, and some people invisible and illegitimate. There's a, there's a visual element to that. And that's what I'm trying, the argument I'm trying to, to build is, is around that. So the way that targeting works in sites like the Border Targeting Centre is all about visualising potentially risky subjects via data insights. It's using the insights of data, pattern recognition, associations of elements, similarities to previous ideas of risk, to bring a risky subject into sight, so to be able to view a risky subject in a meaningful and actionable way. The data-led data risk analysis at Borders anyway is part of what Louisa Moore has called an economy of attention. That is the apparently neutral and objective visualization on the border targeter's screen hit with an associated number, just like these guys are saying, it's like an objective way of decision making. This is a kind of a, a power laden visual practice that literally screens out millions of legitimate journeys that needn't, that needn't detain us, that needn't bother us, for the matter of paying um, scrutiny and attention to smaller numbers of high risk, high threat journeys and people and objects. And to be clear, the economy of attention around data targeting is a dividing and uneven practice. It acts unevenly over populations and individuals. It distinguishes and divides you know, kind of people in racialized, gendered ways, frequently articulating much older kind of divisions in populations and so forth. So, but, so I, I think I'm arguing here that we should be really skeptical of the idea that this is an objective, neutral targeting. But actually, it, it reformulates kind of older divisions in a way that makes it much harder to unpack or to ascertain. And I'll kind of return to that point. Um, I don't forget later on. I just wanted to kind of show you a, a quote that I. It's a, it's a long quote, sorry for all of the words on the page, but it's a quote from one of the data targeters um, showing you how rules-based targeting works. Um, so this is the kind of this is this is all about finding new targets. So not about matching for people that we know, but finding new targets. And so here the data analyst is talking about um, customers for their rules-based targeting. Um, and so somebody from customs or, or, or from the police, for instance, will come with a, a kind of a set of intelligence 
But in this case, it's um, kind of uh, young girls being trafficked out of um, certain regions of Nigeria for, for domestic servitude in the West, and certain kind of markers of risk that enable kind of border officials to identify this. So here, for instance, they're taking intelligence that usually these girls are trafficked kind of via Dubai, for instance. They tend to have a passport that's got at the very last minute. Um, there's a certain kind of journey, the ticket's booked at the last moment, and then they take those rules and they apply them to kind of new passenger data to throw up other, you know, so, so what we know about the situation throws up a kind of a, a scenario, a targeting scenario, where we can ask the system to throw back to us all sorts of other similar journeys. Now it's not enough that you just pick up people, you know, kind of young girls traveling from, in this case, Nigeria, you have to have it together with the last minute ticket purchase, together with the kind of buy and buy, and that's what's going to give you new subjects of scrutiny. I mean, that's how it works in practice, you know, in the border targeting centre. So, so far I've argued that there's a very different um, uh, kind of, uh, a very different logic to the kinds of insights that we're talking about through data in border targeting centres and so forth. And it's very different from those kind of early discussions about insight and ongoing discussions about kind of, you know, human-centred insight. And the insights of data are all about gathering information for one single, accessible, actionable view. And that data targeting the insights of data enable data to become tractable, kind of knowable, accessible, and it's all about focusing attention, and that we should pay attention to the way attention works, because it does screen out certain journeys and people in order to target, you know, in a, in a kind of problematic way. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of politics of targeting, and what we might, what the relationship that we might draw between targeting and insight. Um, and of course, when you talk about targeting, and this is something I don't think that's appeared very often in, in lots of the work about data, the border targeting centre is all about targeting, okay? And so targeting is usually uh, has kind of very military, uh, kind of battle space connotations. And in the next section, I want to draw an analogy between, you know, kind of uh, between uh, kind of targeting in a military sense and some of the targeting that we see in places like the border targeting centre. So in his work, um, Targets of Opportunity, the historian Samuel Weber traces the historical configuration of knowledge, visiting, and targeting. And his examples are all from theatres of war, classic theatres of war. And he argues that targeting involves some basic principles, you know, all the way back to kind of, you know, ancient, ancient Greeks to, to modern drone targeting. Targeting has some basic principles. The enemy, he argues, has to be identified, localised, named, and depicted in order to be able to be made into an accessible target. And targeting is very much closely bound up with the faculty of vision. Here he's drawing on the oculocentrism of kind of Western thought, um, because vision is most closely associated, he argues, with the constitution of knowledge, and hence its power to overcome distance and assimilate alterity. So he builds on Jean-Luc Nancy's uh, discussion of scopos. Um, so Nancy discusses the difference between scopos as a kind of a um, kind of an ancient uh, kind of Greek. Ma ma uh, of, uh, thinking around targeting in the military context. Skopos for Nancy is a target or goal which one has in sight and at which one takes aim. The goal presently and clearly offered to an intention. And what Weber does really is he uses Nancy's uh, discussion of Skopos, from which we get telescope and scopic regime, Nancy's discussion of Skopos to emphasize the privileged relationship between targeting, aiming, and sighting. So he's again drawing our attention to the very visual elements of What's interesting for, for my purposes here, and what I want to draw attention to, is the way that Weber draws out a relationship between targeting, the precision of having something in your sights, and a survey, being able to see an entire military terrain. So he, he says you, you need a survey of everything in order to be able to target properly. That's, 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 his, um, that's his argument. So he draws a kind of a relationship between the target and the survey. And he argues that to be, able to, sur to be able to survey in order to take aim implies a position in what he calls above the fray. So he takes examples through history, military examples from philosophy as well, to say that the view from above, 
the view above the fray, above the battle space, is a privileged position of mastery and control, and it's absolutely fundamental to the kind of the precision targeting that we are used to thinking about. And of course, you can see this really clearly when you think of a, you know, when you think of the example of kind of drone warfare, for instance. You know that we're very used now, and it's perfectly. For large swathes of history, it was impossible to get the true view from above. But now, of course, that's what battle spaces are. It's an all-surveillance survey of an entire terrain, coupled with a very precise targeting technologies. And so I think, you know, we can, we can hold um, kind of the, the example of drone aerial views and t precision targeting, uh, not as a straightforward analogy, but like summarising Weber's themes, that the view from above and the target are completely linked. And of course there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of really kind of fascinating work on drone imagery and aerial views, um, and the way that the kind of surveillance overview in, in drone warfare re-articulates colonial male gaze, for instance, um, and the way in which kind of human vision within a complete socio-technical assemblage um, kind of augments and alters human visual capacities. And I do not absolutely want to make a straightforward link between the technologies of drone warfare and so forth with the kinds of data targeting that I've spoken about. But I would want to draw attention to the way in which both have a kind of desire for visual omniscience, for visual, all-encompassing knowledge at their heart. And that actually, the desire for an all-encompassing view in order to target with precision and accuracy is at the heart of something like Emerald, but also the data targeting that I've spoken about. So the desire for visual surveillance omniscience and mastery that's kind of very straightforwardly offered by the drone it's also at play in the way that the software developers talk about the collation of all available information for one single view. Okay, it's a similar kind of logic at play. And here it's really important to note that the kind of rules-based targeting that I spoke about before, when kind of input rules are entered into a, into a database to throw back particular targets, the cutting edge data analytics that are increasingly available to security authorities, the border security context and so forth, are less about inputting rules and more about using algorithms to generate in completely new insights via knowledge extraction. So the cutting edge analytics that are making their way into systems like the automated targeting system in the US, it's no longer quite possible to ascertain either the rule or the limit of all available information. And perhaps most importantly, the separation, the, the identification of a target is no longer really the application of a pre-existing rule, Nigeria, certain age, you know, fight by Dubai, and more about mining to generate patterns that may or may not be unusual or worthy of scrutiny. I mean, this is the cutting edge of analytics. Um, so it's not really possible now to recover the rules through which somebody might be identified as a target, but rather a person becomes a target because of what he or she shares with others around clusters of risk. So you're, you're identified by your associations, by the traces that you leave behind. So the work of the analytics increasingly is to carve out, kind of to seize from the environment something that's worthy of attention. It's about being able to gain a tractable, a tractable view of all available information in order to focus specifically on targets of interest. Um, and the argument I think I've quite clumsily made is that we can see resonances there between the kind of the, you know, the all surveillance view of the drone and, 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 and the kind of the, 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 the military and the kinds of desires at play in wanting to kind of get data to be tractable and actionable. Okay, we can ask questions about that at the end if I haven't made that clear. The next stage, I want to talk a little bit about the people themselves, okay? So I've argued so far that the insights of data, we should understand to have a violent, almost military connotation. We should take that seriously. Targeting via data has a violence, you know, in, in recognition of targets and subjects of interest, um, and that using a kind of a militarized connotation isn't, you know, it's justified, I think, but 
The other side of the paper I want to talk is about the experiences of the people themselves, the people working with the data, and what kinds of insights they offer or can input into, into, into the work. So here again a couple of um, uh, examples of uh, an example that the data analyst uh, spoke about. And here the person's talking about the work that is undertaken by kind of the humans in the loop, you know, the, the human machine operators. Um, and so this person talks about the idea that sis the system can only see a flag made on the fact that some passenger has been picked up 18 years ago because he, you know, he, he had some cannabis. And there is no point, if you look at the whole picture, sending resources to kind of, you know, to, to, to apprehend this target. Um, because now, of course, he's 18 years old, he's got a family, he's on a holiday, you know, kind of within Europe, there's, there's no point. But the system can't see that. The system only sees cannabis, cannabis, you know, criminal records and so forth. So here, the example, you know, this is why I, I picked this example, because it gives an insight, I guess, into the work that the data analysts are doing on a daily basis. To, to revise, to check, to review the matches that are thrown up by the system. And of course, here we can turn to some of the public debate around algorithms in, you know, in security contexts, but also more broadly. Because of course, the roles of automation and algorithms have raised you know, a number of serious concerns. There's the worry recently expressed in the, in the, the, kind of, uh, the committee in the UK that algorithms might produce flawed or biased decisions. You know, we, we shouldn't trust algorithms because there's a kind of inbuilt discrimination and bias that happens within them. We should be really careful automating decisions about people. Um, there's human rights infringements, kind of, you know, unknown kind of discriminatory uh, kind of factors at play, as well as privacy and data protection issues. All of these things are featured in the public, you know, debate about algorithms. And what the authorities try to do, I think, at every turn, is to reassure the public by downplaying the role of automation and downplaying the kind of the, the crucial role of algorithms in decisions about finance, security, and so forth. They try to reimagine or try to reassert what Hales has called the liberal humanist subject, a subject that she argues is completely separable from socio-technical assemblages. We can still pinpoint somebody who's ultimately responsible or liable or accountable, somebody who could answer for the decision. So lots of the way in which the, the, the kind of authorities respond to public concerns is about reasserting the human to review and so forth. But for critics of the authorities, this, these assertions are misleading. And here we have another kind of um, another uh, kind of imaginary within the debate, which is that the, the human becomes a kind of rubber stamping, you know, kind of trusting kind of element in the assemblage. That we should be really careful about introducing auto, you know, kind of automation and algorithms because humans will automatically just think it's truthful and kind of rubber stamp and won't be critical or skeptical and so forth. So on one side of the debate we have the worry that humans are being replaced and that you know kind of human agents and decision making no longer makes sense. And on the other hand, you know, we have the idea that kind of algorithms you know are, are, are kind of trusting, it's either techno determinism or kind of a reassertion of the, of, of the human in, in kind of quite a pro problematic, divisive way. Now, I agree with Amador and Blank when they argue that there's a depoliticizing tendency in both the authorities' insistence on strongly separating humans and technologies in security contexts and elsewhere, but also, they argue, we should be skeptical of critical social sciences efforts to date in downplaying what they argue is an association and a division of labor between humans and machines. So I think they're, they're calling for us to be skeptical of both some of the public fears about you know, humans being replaced, but also they're arguing that we should see kind of human-machine assemblages as, as very much being an associate, a kind of composite, and a division of labor. You know? and, and this is, this is the way I, mean, I find their point of view compelling when I look at the, the field work that I've done. It's, that, that's, I know there's a lot, I agree with their, with their point of view. So what is the division of labor in the border targeting center that I, that I worked in? Now here I point out that the data analyst that I worked with spoke a lot about kind of glitches with the system. It never worked properly. 
you know, kind of there were lots of false positives, people who identified because you know, there were data entry issues, um, there'd be a hundred percent numeric value attached to a kind of you know a hit when actually you know the, the, the date of birth was wrong. You know, there were millions of people, you know, who, who've got a you know kind of date of birth. Date of birth aren't the same around the world. There's all sorts of reasons why they had to be skeptical of the system. And they spoke a lot about being able to game it as well. They had a series of kind of cultural targets and bureaucratic targets within their workplace. And being able to kind of you know, process through matches becomes a kind of a, a game. So they're very much in tune with the system, but in no way were they kind of rubber stamping and trusting. You know, there, was a, there was much more of a kind of complex interplay at, at the interface that I've described. So against the view that humans simply kind of rubber stamp the recommendations of computers, the field that I've done shows that actually they were frequently skeptical, mistrustful, you know, kind of frustrated with the system that they worked in. And they often had to correct or again augment the matches that the system had thrown up. But the argument I guess I'd like to make is that theirs was a very curious style of inquiry and they were very much oriented towards who somebody was and the story behind the match, as well as whether he or she, the passenger, posed a risk. So of course they were interested in kind of criminal histories and kind of previous asylum claims and, and all of the security relevant. But they, they spoke a lot about um, kind of piecing together a story and being able to kind of you know to, to put work in to try and work out why the system had kind of you know had thrown this person up as being of kind of you know of, of, of scrutiny. So in this example, for instance, um, a kind of, uh, somebody was, uh, a passenger was flagged up as having an unusual travel history. They, they, they've gone on a journey that doesn't seem to make sense. And the data analyst is talking about, you know, having to kind of, you know, to, to, to read between the lines to, to kind of a kind of curiosity, you know, and kind of trying to see who the person was and why this, this match, what, what makes sense of, of you know, of their apparently a, a non a knowledge journey. And she talks a lot about that's the work that she was doing. You know, why is the system sending this person and kind of having to dig between the lines? There are other examples of this, of a kind of a curiosity and a kind of detective-like, you know, kind of set of investigations as to why this person's kind of why this person appeared on my screen. And here, I, I would like to return to the beginning kind of historical anecdote that I, I talked about, which is the confrontation between the Gestalt theorists and the cyberneticists. And again, I'd like to kind of come back to the view of insight that the stealth theorists offered um, at that particular juncture when artificial intelligent computing was just setting off. Because although it doesn't really feature heavily in the histories of, cybernetic of cybernetics, and there are lots of histories of cybernetics, the Gestalt theorists interchange with key kind of figures of computing and machine learning and so forth actually came from a much longer kind of tradition of Gestalt thinking that originated in Germany. So the Gestalt theorists I mean, are super interesting. Many of them were Jewish and German and had to flee kind of Europe as war broke out. And they struggled to find a foothold in the American kind of system where lots of them had to were emigrated. Um, uh, kind of positivism and behavioralism were very much dominant in the post-war context in America for social scientists and for psychology. And they were very much concerned with the experiments about vision and cognition, really with reasserting in an uncertain and chaotic world a place for the human. Theirs was a, almost a moral quest for reasserting human domination, control, and importance in a world that appeared to be increasingly taken over by technologies of their era. So at the historical juncture that they were writing, they were very much to do with kind of reasserting the human, in a way that I think is very relevant with, with today's world. There's a kind of a similar recourse to kind of human agency and so forth in the face of kind of chaos and change. So Gestalt theory, at least in its early forms, sought to claim a place for human aesthetic experience and human agency and human value in a world that was dominated by the reductionist, positivist spirit of what Gestalt theorists called nothing but. So science in their time, kind of, you know, kind of interwar and post-war context, reduced human cognition and kind of and, and kind of the world around us to nothing but nothing but the movement of atoms, nothing but the interception of neural, you know, kind of neural pathways. We are nothing but 
We can be reduced to the individual elements that make us up. Um, and they actually linked this to kind of to, to catastrophes like the flourishing of, of kind of Nazi Germany because they argued that, that human evil wasn't a problem, but piecemeal thinking was. Reducing everything to nothing but was a problem, a moral problem, as well as kind of scientifically, you know, kind of um, not having any grounds. And they argued really kind of interestingly that truth. Truth was a matter not of grasping individual elements, but being able to perceive a whole. So just as you may be able to see a dog here from the background, just as the whole kind of leaps out at you, they linked this visual and cognitive capacity to a moral endeavour, which is that we should retain a place for human agency and aesthetic experience amidst you know, the kind of rise of technology and of a, of a kind of reductionist science. So it's hard, I think, not to draw analogies between the stealth thinking and some of the problems that we have nowadays with, with targeting via data. I mean, this could exactly be written about the work that the data targeters do. So it might be the case that somebody is flagged up by, in a piecemeal sense, that the attributes they share or are clustered together around risk, but that doesn't really tell us anything about the truth of the person you know, behind travelling from Australia to Dubai, for instance. A thing may be true in a piecemeal sense, and false in the lies part of its whole. You know, the, the, the difference between the elements that make up a picture of risk and the whole story behind it. So the, 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 the argument I'm trying to make here, then, is that there's two elements of insight at play. The targeting, targeting via data insights, it's about recognising a person based on individual elements and clusters of risk, about visualising known and unknown targets, you know, by their associations and behaviours, but we, but at work in the data targeting centre is still a kind of insight that, that grasps the whole, the whole life. But while the Gestaltists in kind of, you know, quotes like this were very much concerned with reasserting the human, I don't think in today's world it makes a lot of sense to kind of reassert what Hales calls the liberal humanist subject, or to retrieve a kind of simplistic human ethics that, you know, people make the right decisions, we should, you know, kind of keep a place for human. I think the point I'm trying to make is not to kind of return to, to start thinking that's not what I'm saying, but rather that crises of human places and the role of technology are not new, but actually in previous historical times we've encountered that very similar sets of issues and that some of what we see today are new to our times, but some is much more part of a long-standing working out of, of the role and the division of labour between humans and machines. And it's to understand, if we recall the words of Lorraine Daston, that calculating machines from the very start have shaped human cognition and intelligence. That the history of technology is about a changing history of understanding what humans are capable of, human intelligence and cognition, and that we should be very attentive to the precise way that this happens. So more than anything else, I guess the paper is a call for paying a lot of attention to the association and division of labour that's at work in places like the targeting centre, but also elsewhere. That we should be sceptical of the techno-determinist view, but also about reasserting this liberal human ethics, and to see that actually all the way through history, humans and technologies, human capacities and machine capacities have gone hand in hand, and that this is that we are living through the latest iteration of that, of that history. Okay, so I'll sum up some of the things that I've tried to say in the paper. In a recent intervention, Claudia Aradu um, argues that technologies of insecurity often appear different, novel, unprecedented, but critical work needs to reformulate analytical tools that can grasp the reconfiguration and recomposition of discourses, technologies, and practices. So what I've tried to do in this paper is to, is, to, is to take a long view and a wider view of both insight and targeting, and that to show that these things both have a history and how they work together in places like the Border Targeting Centre is worthy of our attention. I've argued that insights, you know, data insights are often pre treated uncritically, but there's a distinct history about insight and the division of labour between humans and machines. I've argued that data insights are very much related to kind of to a, to a violent, with military connotations, idea of targeting, and that we shouldn't look upon targeting without being mindful of that military history. 
And I related data targeting to a survey, to a mastery of all that we see, to a view from above, a view from above the, the, the brain, that data appears to offer a total view, a view that's beyond capacities, but actually this view is produced by kind of vastly complex algorithms that make some people visible and other people invisible, and we need to know how that works. I argue that contrary to prominent debates that circulate you know, in, kind of in popular discourse, but also actually in lots of academic circles, Humans are in no way being replaced by technological processes, but neither are technologies simply speeding up existing processes. The automated systems in places like the National Border Targeting Centre align security attention. But the analysts that I spoke to have a very complicated relationship with systems. They're neither deferential or unthinking, but neither is their work unchanged. And the paying close attention to the way that kind of work, that the decisions happen is, is really Productive. And we should also be wary both of techno determinism, about kind of giving too much power to algorithms, but also just simply reasserting Hales as liberal humanist subject if we want to understand the contemporary configuration of security, accountability, liability, and targeting. I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. So we have about uh, 35, 40 minutes for questions, so um, I have a bunch, but if people open up the floor, please introduce yourself before you ask a question if you can. Uh, my name is Samantha. Hi. I, I work for the uh, Center of Canada, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time uh, to speak to us. I'm just wondering if you came across uh, the concept that algorithms are improving. Yeah. So there would be this fear that they would eventually replace yeah. human. I don't know if you came across that, because I know that they've been saying, you know, Google and all these things, like these little uh, assistants that help you, uh, I don't know, make lists or, yeah. or, you know, or you ask them any questions, they're able to really provide you something quite quickly. Yeah. So I don't know if you came across that concept, or is there that fear, at least, for people who work in offices like that? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. So I guess I would answer that kind of in two ways, which is about the way that the, and I can only really speak with great authority about the targeters that I spoke to. Um, so I, you know, although I made some generalizations and I think they were applicable, you know, I want to be clear that the, you know, the, the authority I speak is around a particular context about data targeting. And I think, you're, first of all, there was a sense in which, um, just in a kind of workplace culture sense, uh, lots of the, um, the work that the targeters were doing um, was surrounded by a set of anxieties about, about job loss and about job change and about kind of deprofessionalization. So I think there's probably a whole different paper to be written about, about the bureaucratic culture of a place where these targeters worked and the, and the rise of automation and, and kind of algorithms. Um, but what I would um, uh, kind of say on that as well is that um, there was a kind of quite a fraught relationship between the targeting center that generated kind of hits and matches and sent alerts, and the frontline staff who often completely ignored them. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you know, in lots of the kind of the work that you just assume that there's, you know, the kind of the, the glossy techno science is really kind of, but actually, a lot of them were just, you know, they'd never hear whether the, the, whether the person was encountered or what happened. And, and I think that was partly to do with um, uh, people retaining their kind of professional status kind of are wanting to kind of um, uh, reassert themselves in the rise of technology. So there's a lot of kind of workplace culture stuff which is going on, I think, at the time, which I didn't touch on, but I think it's really important for understanding how technologies enter workplaces. And then I guess what I would say as well is that they had a series of problems um, with the system, which was also, you know, the, the kind of the automated system that they used, which was it was kind of glitchy and, and didn't work properly, and they were always uh, mentioning uh, the, the new software that was out there that would kind of give them the information that they and, and the capacity that they really needed. Of course, this is a really fast-moving terrain, and and, um, and they were really uh, kind of hopeful that the software packages that they were going to be able to implement in their particular work was going to be a lot less to do with just straightforward matching and straightforward rules-based targeting, but a lot more to do with kind of knowledge discovery and extraction and, and, and mining. 
Um, so I guess if the answer, if the question was about kind of uh, about algorithms kind of improving, I would come back with an answer that they all they always wanted a better software package that was vastly expensive and that was you know that, that they realised they probably wouldn't get something you know that, that would be at work in some of the big kind of you know kind of global companies. You know they wanted that capacity because if you were able to extract knowledge. That was how they were going to get at the, the ultimate goal, which was the unknown, you know, the, 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 the trafficking route they didn't yet know about. You know, the ability to be able to kind of pinpoint somebody whose behaviour didn't fit with any you know, pre-given uh, kind of clusters of risk, but nonetheless was definitely worthy of attention because it was just unusual or anomalous. And that's the capacity that they wanted. Um, so, and to be clear that the people um, didn't really know a lot about how the technology worked, the people I spoke to at least. You know, they weren't in charge of developing, you know, that, that was something in the kind of software developers who were in charge of that. But they did have a sense that there was better stuff out there that is, is doubtless, you know, kind of coming into place. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just in, in response to that too, I think your answer even maybe as algorithms do improve, the privacy concerns are also going to improve and hopefully come into play. Yeah. Um, and and with the discussion may change. Yeah. It's not what can we do, it's, it'll be what should we do and how, which is actually better for both the human security, yeah. but also just overall. Yeah. Um, the discussion needs to change. You allude, you talk about the power of stuff, yeah. um, but kind of in the background, yeah. <laughs> and that to me is really interesting. In what you were presenting, um, I'm curious. I have a question um, about. Um, you said the big data brings the risky subjects into sight and makes other people disappear, and so I'm curious a bit more if you could talk a little bit more about the people. And just what that means to you, yeah. is that good or bad? Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe good and bad is the wrong question. Yeah. Um, but you also talked about, your example was the targeting to identify traffickers, the example of the Nigerian girls in specific, yeah. specific scenario. And I know that was just an example, but I'm just curious where you were going with that, because I got all caught up in, hey, that's a good thing. <laughs> we want to yeah. know those scenarios. Oh, yeah. But so what, where were you going with yeah. that? Okay. Um, and, and I know that uh, here I am being all, oh, this is good and that's bad. Yeah. And, <laughs> and But it, those are some of the ethical questions that I think we do need to be asking. Yeah. And of course, privacy does come into it as yeah. well. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. So um, so about uh, kind of appearing and disappearing, um, uh, say about that. so in, in the context that I was working, um, to disappear within the targeting they were doing means that you're not worthy of attention. Mm -hmm. And, and if that's why the technologies, the solutions, the, the, the risk-based targeting is sold as being both good for the traveling public mm -hmm. and good for the authorities. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, in the European context, I'm not sure what the situation is in kind of Canada or in the States, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a lot of... Um, uh, it's about how to target resources effectively. Mm -hmm. Do you need to check everyone's passport? You know, do you really need to check everyone's passport coming in and out? Do you really need to kind of you know keep people in line um, when they're just kind of you know going back to support their family somewhere like Spain or kind of France? You know? um, and then that's what kind of eGate is supposed to be doing. It's mm -hmm. about you know we don't need to, to look at you know the vast majority of the public, and that's why you shouldn't. Worry about you know the kind of about the facial recognition technologies that are in place in airports and airports because this is about not looking at you. you know. So lots of the public debate um, in the UK context um, and the European context is about privacy and about knowing about this kind of uncomfortable sense that that um, we're all subject to a kind of a surveillance view that people are watching when I'm going on holiday and all that. But for the authorities, I think it's, it's exactly the opposite. It's sold as a way of not focusing on millions of normal journeys and being able to be a lot smarter about the way that um, 
the security authorities use their resources. Sure, but then it's about how they determine whether you're worthy of attention or exactly. not. Exactly. Because of course, yeah. you are being you are still in the surveilling exactly right? exactly so, 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 so your data so, the whole process. Yeah. so it might not be that you know me alex hall is of interest to kind of any one of the border but my data yeah. about the travel patterns that yeah. i as a kind of you know a regular citizen so forth you know it feeds into the overall view that's produced by data yeah. so you can only tell what's normal and abnormal by getting masses of of, yeah. of information about daily journeys so I completely agree with you, like the line between somebody who's, who's, who wants attention and someone who doesn't want attention is really problematic. Mm -hmm. And we should, I guess, be wary of, of the kind of the reassurances that we're like, we're not looking at you, we're not interested, oh. you know, well, actually we're, we're just interested in kind of certain... We're not um, interested in that people. Oh, just that like, who's that. Yeah, and, and then I think, so the rules-based targeting, of course, um, I mean, the example I gave there about, uh, the, uh, about the trafficking who could argue that that was not a, a good use of, you know, who, very few people could argue that was a kind of a bad thing to, yeah. kind of, to try and, and that's of course why um, it appears to be a kind of a good thing for the authorities to be able to, so we don't know about a particular person, but we do know that their behaviour fits a pattern of risk that we're really interested in. Yeah. Um, but there are more problematic examples, I think, of that, you know, yeah. for instance, about young men certain nationalities kind of travelling via Amsterdam, having come from somewhere, you know, like North Africa. I mean, everything is beyond our imagination to imagine that as well as kind of examples like, you know, kind of human trafficking, there's also a kind of probably quite stereotypical, racialized profiles circulating that generate new subjects of interest. So if you're somebody who has family in North Africa and you have girlfriend in Amsterdam, you're going to constantly find yourself, you know, kind of being called aside and so forth. That's, that's how it works. So you're, you're targeted, I think, in quite a problematic way. And that's just from the rules-based targeting. And of course, it's all, it's, I mean, it's extremely difficult. I mean, the recent kind of, uh, in the UK context, kind of recent reviews of algorithms in public life and kind of studies about PNR data have all thrown up the idea that we just don't know. It's impossible to retrieve the rules through which we might become a target. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a target for kind of for, you know for commercial activities like you know why is the website sent me that advert mm -hmm. you know for something that you did three months ago. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, why do I keep getting called aside in security? Mm -hmm. Well, not even the practitioners themselves probably know because increasingly the cutting edge is not about inputting rules in the, the case of the trafficking case, but actually about just throwing up anomalies of various kinds and just speculatively kind of finding connections. And that's far more problematic for privacy advocates and for, and for kind of discrimin you know, for, kind of for, for people concerned about discrimination and so forth. But the final thing I'd say is that in, in a recent in the UK recent review of it, they had a they, they're, they're trying to kind of pin down what really is an automated decision. So what does automation really mean? when a decision is really automated and there has to be some kind, there has to be a meaningful human review or input into the final decision. Mm -hmm. So that it can't just be that, you know, the computer says no and you can't get a credit, you can't get a mortgage. There has to be in a kind of, and what's really interesting about that is like that you're trying to quantify what meaningful human interaction is mm -hmm. in an increasingly problematic way. Mm -hmm. And if, I mean, how could, is that meaningful, what, does, what they were doing when they were actually only processing the people that were thrown up on the screen? Like, mm -hmm. what, do, what would meaningful input mean? But that's a kind of fine grained frontiers mm -hmm. <laughs> of backing back against this about exactly quantifying what automation means and doesn't mean. Mm -hmm. That's a very long way to answer, sorry. Mm -hmm. but, Uh, so along these lines, we're looking at policy implications of using data in something like racial recognition technology yeah. uh, in a sphere where uh, emerging technologies, you don't know, uh, you don't have a basis, you don't have a foundation, although you're saying that we do have this pattern in the past of these divisions of labor with machines and humans yeah. as far as the ethical implications and the capacity for harm. 
uh, we are on an upscale. Yeah. Uh, so in looking at doing policy making, I was curious if you had any, I guess, filters or frameworks that you think are worthwhile for how you can translate what you've learned here into how you make policy in this area. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, um, how to, how to get these insights into, into policy. I guess, um, and this is, a, this is what, this is what, the, you know, kind of people who are critical of this stuff are trying to do, about kind of tweaking the, the technologies to make them either protect privacy better or protect rights better. Um, and I guess I'd come back and say that that it's possible to protect people's privacy and to kind of do this stuff that appears to conform to the kind of human rights. We might have this review and make sure training data, for instance, for algorithms is not biased. You know, we might make sure that there are checks and balances in, in developing technologies and algorithms for machine learning in, in facial recognition. You know, we might want to make sure that you know that kind of uh, software developers, you know, are kind of inclusive and diverse when they're generating. And you can do all of that. I think all of that would go some way to addressing some of the kind of unfairness and, and, and potentially discriminatory aspects. So it's about making sure that there's kind of diversity and critique at every level. So lots of these, you know, so facial recognition. Um, Machine learning, and if you if you have a kind of a bias or a skew set of data that the machine learns on, it's, it's going to produce biased results. And all the way through the kind of the um, the reviews and the um, the justifications by software companies, we, we hear the idea that algorithms are only as biased as the data that they've given. So I mean that's one way that that's one frontier of doing it. Um, but I still don't know whether um, the bigger conversation. Is the one that the Gestalt theorists, you know, the cyberneticists were having in the 1890s, you know, nearly 100 years ago, which is about what is the place of the human in, in these activities? It's, it's a bigger kind of philosophical question. You know, do we want to trust machines? You know, do we want to have a, a you know, we, we can't kind of can't go backwards, but you know, what kinds of divisions of labour are we comfortable with as a society? Um, does it, you know, can we tweak the technologies to make them, to make sure that they're kind of fair and less well, Yes, we can. Can we address privacy concerns by making sure that people can't be readily identified with their name until they emerge as a subject of interest? Well, yes, we can. But that doesn't touch the bigger debate, which is, you know, the, about the meaning or, or why the, the human is still seen to be a kind of a pivotal point in kind of ethics and so forth. I think some of the cutting edge work, I mean, you know, Louisa Moore's written, you know, has got a book coming out shortly about, about algorithmic ethics, about a whole new way of thinking about kind of ethics in the context of machine learning. Um, and I think that's where the cutting, I think that's where the cutting edge will be. You know, we can look at a small scale thing, but if we can think about the way that it might be unfair and produce discriminatory results, but what we really need for our age is a peak kind of rethinking about the role of the human and the machine in, in ethics. Um, and that's the thing where the debate will be happening to. And on the very policy oriented question, I guess, I, I think what I would say is it's perfectly possible to address kind of public concerns and to reassure the public that you can make some of this, but that doesn't solve, that doesn't address the bigger question, the bigger mm -hmm. ethical question. Yes. Um, I don't see any uh, Are you talking about the, the, the smart readers? The machine yeah. you go through and you get a piece of paper from that machine. Yeah. And then you take your passport, that piece of paper, your yeah. boarding pass, and go to the, the, the customer's office. Yeah, so um, that's, 
as I understand it, um, well, is it ESTA? Be the, that's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of authorised to drop. That's effectively. That is, that is actually a little bit later because that's effectively doing. I think the the PA the the um, some of the work of the API watch list matching. So you send your information ahead of time, your passport information ahead of time. Um, when you fill out that thing that you know kind of before you travel, you know, when, I, when I came to Canada to fill that thing in, and you get like a thing back. They are doing effectively. I think the watch bit of this check. They're doing, you know, is this person kind of known to the Canadian authorities? Do they, have they, you know, do they need a visa? Have they applied for visa before? Have they, is there anything that at all kind of concerns us? Um, I mean, increasingly you're asked for that information ahead of time. Um, and yes, I think there is probably a kind of a risk-based PNR kind of scenario going on. Um, Related to that, so you know, having got your passport data, um, they're going to watch this check you. But when you kind of check in to board the flight, they're matching that information with your PNR data, and they're doing much more of a kind of a, a scenario-based kind of profiling on you too. So anyway, your ability to pass smoothly through that whole process rests, I imagine. I mean, I know in the you know in the context where I worked, it worked. It rests on this stuff happening behind. Um, but actually, um, it, it's you know the, the, the desire is to get it kind of near real time, you know. So it's often you know kind of um, the data is transmitted ahead of you getting on the flight, um, and the idea is that you're able to kind of you know to, to get that person when they arrive at the border. So the short answer is some of that kind of some of that smart gate stuff is to do with you know kind of capturing biometrics and just smoothing the process through making it quicker. But um, giving up certain um, kind of um, bits of your data before you travel um, is all about making sure that you're not known to the authorities. You, know, you don't have to watch this. So yeah, I imagine that's that's going on behind the scenes. And it makes some people's journey through airports a lot more difficult than others. I've never been called aside. You know, I know people who, and I teach this stuff at kind of at, at, um, to the students. Lots of students come. Oh, you know, that's why I always get stopped, you know, kind of going back and forth on certain journeys. It makes a lot more sense to them. <coughs> I've got a question. Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned that there's a kind of similarity between the, the targeting center and a call center, right? Even in the sort of aesthetic layout, it looks very similar. Yeah. Um, from what we know about call centers, I thankfully have not had to work in a call center. But from what we know about them, they're very disciplinary spaces. There's yeah. lots of very, um, lots of very intense kind of labor management going on in terms of targets. Yeah. Um, I'm curious the extent to which the people that you speak to, that yeah. you spoke to in the targeting center, experience that kind of labor discipline or other forms of um, discipline, whether yeah. it's from their superiors that are human or whether it's from their tools that are non-human. There's a whole other paper. About in my head, it's called fatigue. fatigue. Yeah. You know, kind of like you know, border targeting and fatigue, and it, was, it would be all around that, which I didn't really touch on there. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It was a really, really grim environment to work in. <clears throat> it was like kind of you know, it works. You got the, the night shifts were exhausting. There were lots of pressures involved with the kind of the rhythms of the system. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is that you know, kind of certain times of the day were very busy in terms of flights, or flights at least that you'd want to kind of have a good, you know, good eye on. Um, and that the, and the, the disciplining mechanism of the system, as you describe, is exactly that. So people get very anxious about the fact that it's, you know, there's 20 flights coming in, and so there's a lunch, and you know, it's just me, there's someone coming in, and the idea that you could always trace back to individuals, you know, whether they, the worst thing would be the person who kind of okayed someone to come in and actually was somebody that, that, that they wanted to apprehend. So definitely there's a kind of, a very a kind of close, yeah, like an effective relationship, kind of a, a negative and positive one. So um, lots of the data targeters spoke to about night shifts and how they really hated but loved night shifts because they, they kind of wore slippers. They kind of came in in like kind of like slippers and didn't bother shaving for a week and they just had their headphones on. 
and it's all to do with like kind of just clicking through the numbers to get their targets up for that target, as in not kind of ascertaining how many people were coming in that were worthy of attention, but more like you know you need to go through like you know 50 in an hour or whatever. So there's a, there was a really intense kind of awareness of the system and its in its busy times and its you know its kind of quiet times. And then I think you know it, it, it's a heavy, it was a heavily bureaucratic environment too, in that um, uh, people worked in I mean the whole workplace social media, people worked in teams and there were goals for each team that kind of related to kind of goals for individuals. There was a you know lots of kind of workplace sniping about who didn't pull their weight and who did there's a whole story to tell about how as a workplace it you know it, it transferred all the things that we might we might expect to find in a bureaucratic environment into a very kind of highly managed like you said, highly disciplined kind of bureaucratic space. I mean, we'd like to find that paper. But what's really interesting is that if you, if you yes, the clear hierarchies, people working at the, the bottom, the kind of the match analysts, um, often complained about not being able to use their discretion enough. They wanted to do more. I mean, some of them spoke about, you know, when they first joined the, the, the job, they were like really, you know, they were spending hours investigating kind of like certain kinds of, um, you know, kind of ethnic groups from Afghanistan, and they were like working out, you know, the, the, the pattern of people travelling, and, and it was all just like, oh, you know, just don't bother, you know, just don't, don't bother doing that, just, you know, kind of get on with doing your 50, and it was a, it was a, a story they told of kind of crushing, being kind of crushing agency, you know, they were just there to kind of process the matches. As well, coupled with a kind of you know crushing of their agency, was also a kind of a great deal of stress that some of them found in making sure they were doing it quickly and efficiently, and not being the person who was going to be you know you let in so and so, and then look what happened. You know. <coughs> There's a really interesting history that Lorraine Daston wrote about the history of calculation, and she, her example is from kind of early calculating machines, you know before even computing technology as we. As we them and it's about calculating um, a, a kind of tide tables that used to be done kind of by hand, you know, by calculating labour at that time was devolved to kind of individuals and homes. And the history that she's telling is about kind of the, the, the rise of early calculating machines that were supposed to make it easier to automate the labour of calculation. It's effectively kind of early forms of she traces that history through the 18th, 19th, and kind of early 20th century. <coughs> but she has a really interesting discussion about the way that changes in calculating capacity by machines had a huge impact on the working culture and the prestige and the professionalism of the people who had been calculated. So calculators used to be people, if you look back on the history, you know, to be a calculator was to be a kind of, to do mundane aspects of calculation. And one of the things that she discusses really interestingly is about it's about fatigue and the labour of attending to the machines. So the automation was supposed to make things easier. It made some things easier, but it made things some things more difficult in a, in a new way. There was a new problem of reconciling human labour with machine labour. And that's I mean she, the history that she tells is very much of its time. But it's so interesting to think about the way that these things work in places like the targeting centre. That actually the automation hasn't, it's just made things difficult in new ways. There's new difficulties with the labour. So, so some of the people that I spoke to, to finish off, had, had frontline experience. They'd worked literally at kind of, you know, ports of entry and they'd done immigration and they'd made asylum, you know, you know decisions and all the rest of it. Um, and they thought coming here to, to the targeting centre would, you know, they knew it would be a different kind of job. But they spoke a lot about it wasn't easier, it wasn't easier or more difficult, it was just different. The, tar the, the fatigue and the difficulty was just different. And I just think there's, um, I think there's a very interesting kind of set of work around those issues, I think, in contexts like this, but also, I mean, you can think of many other contexts. Like what is the labour that humans are required to do by calculating machines? Lorraine Daston's work shows that in the beginning of computing, labor, there was a great deal of effort expended in readjusting working hours and expectations and so forth around the human labor of attending to the machines. And I think there's exactly the same kind of thing that's happening now. 
and there's a labour and a work and a kind of an emotional energy of all sorts of different kind of work that's expended in attending to machines in various ways. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I just think we're only just beginning to understand how that's working. And I think it's really critical for understanding. If you want to understand in detail how security decisions are, are at the border, then you would need to pay attention to the to the division of labour. It's Claudia and Tobias Blank with the division of labour and the association and the labour of attending to the machines. So, yeah, I mean the, the people there did did. I did have a lot of good things to say about working with the systems. But like, you know, in, a, in the long history of work, labour and machines, this is, I think, just the latest iteration of, you know, of, of altering dynamics. And there's been some really interesting histories written about, I mean, it used to be very female labour. You know, being a calculator was a feminised, a kind of gendered aspect. And early calculators and early attendants of machines, you know, they were usually very lowly paid, you know, lots more women, you know. And then calculation became associated with kind of machines and computing, or the kind of whole kind of gender shift around that. Um, and, there's, and there's lots of really interesting histories about that, which I'd like to touch on in another paper if we didn't get the chance to talk about. We have time for maybe one more question. <coughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're five minutes from the end, I think we can really wrap up. All right, so uh, please uh, give a warm thanks to Alex for. for